Without further ado, Andreas Marsano, you can conveniently read his bio up here, so I can be very short. Um, but for over, he was formerly a journalist, over a decade has covered Indonesia for Human Rights Watch. All of you should put on your early Christmas uh, or Hanukkah or whatever kind of birthday <laughs> list of shopping. Uh, <coughs> a, a book coming out called Race, Islam, and Power, uh, which will be on May 1st. Um, will focus on ethnic and religious violence in post Suharto, Indonesia. Uh, we're very excited to have Andreas here. He is now an <coughs> annual visitor to NYU, um, and we're very happy to have him back. And without further ado, Andreas. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to be clicking brief. Uh, I know that many of you in the audience have covered, have written, have researched Indonesia, uh, East Timor, over the last 20 years. So basically, uh, the argument of this book is that there are so many ethnic and religious violence in Indonesia by many, many forces, local organizations, ethnic groups, religious groups, we specifically are trying to find new equilibrium, new equilibrium in post-Suharto, post-authoritarian military rule in Indonesia. Uh, and then I'm going to argue that of all these forces, the one that is quite successful, is the most successful so far, is the ones that are using uh, Islamism, political Islam. So that is my main argument. But let's go back to uh, some of these uh, website, starting from the fall of Suharto. I'm moving here. Uh, you might remember Seth Maiden's story, uh, May 1998, when President Suharto, after being in power, after rebellion, uh, 32 years, he stepped down and letting his vice president, B.J. Habibie, uh, to be the president. And immediately after this May 1998 event, we saw two major local forces openly challenging the rule of Indonesia. The first one is the Achenis. The Achenis Free, Free Aceh Movement, remember December 1998, organized an open military ceremony saying that we want to be independent from Indonesia. And of course, it triggered uh, years of battle between the Indonesian military and the Free Aceh Movement. It is not sure how many people were killed. Estimate was about 10,000. This Achenis rebellion only ended because of the tsunami, December 2004. <clears throat> 126 people were killed. European Union pressured the Indonesian government to negotiate with the Free Aceh movement. Thus, the Helsinki Agreement signed in August uh, 2005 which basically allow Aceh to have a special autonomy to write their own criminal code to implement the so-called Islamic Sharia. This is important, important topic. I'm going to go back again and again here on Aceh and the Islamic Sharia. As long as, and this is the, one of the most important part of the agreement, the Helsinki agreement, as long as Aceh does not contradict Indonesia's national laws and the international contracts that Indonesia government uh, has ratified, the ICCTR, the ICER International Convention on, on Cultural, Economic, and Social Rights, uh, Convention on Torture, uh, CEDO, Convention, uh, Convention on Women's Rights, uh, Child Protection, etc. That is Aceh. That is what happened in Aceh. And then after the fall of Suharto, we also see 
uh, West Papua plus East Timor uh, openly campaigning for independence from Indonesia. Uh, in Papua until now, it is still going on. Foreign journalists are still restricted to go to Papua. Uh, Papua most popular leader, Thais Ny, was assassinated. And East Timor, you know, uh, also violence. And then Australia sent peacekeeping troops, later the UN, and finally East Timor became independent. In East Timor, the burning, <coughs> the occupation of Indonesia in the three decade from 1975 until 1999, estimated <coughs> one third of the population uh, killed or hunger. Uh, it is according to a UN sponsored uh, severe report. That is the Istimor and then Papua. Another big violence that happened through Suhaka was the killing of ethnic minorities <coughs> on Kalimantan Island. You might remember the gruesome, brutal story of minorities settlers beheaded. If you live in Indonesia at the time, you read mystical after mystical story about flying sword that can look for Madhuris beheading <coughs> the Madhuris. Of course it is also. Uh, you are hearing stories that the Daya, remember the Daya, the Daya, the Daya, which is inaccurate, can sneak if you are a Madhuris and they will kill. Uh, it is not true. The fact is the ones that kill the most Madhuris are ethnic Malay, fellow Muslim. So I cover those killings. I cover the tsunami, I cover Aceh, I cover Papua, I cover East Timor. The one that is so different in Sambas, where the biggest killing of the Madras happened, is that those who chase them are shouting, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, with machetes, with mandal. And those that run away are also saying, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. But in Indonesia and also overseas, the narrative is that they were killed by the Dayan, mostly uh, Christian, although a small part of them are also Muslim. So the killing happened in 1997, 6, uh, 600 in Sambal Little, 99, 3,500 in Sambas, and about 2,500 in Sambit, in central Kalimantan. So that is. Uh, Kalimantan. We are also seeing the emergence of Jama'ah Islamia, an Al Qaeda satellite organization. The first body bombing took place one year before 911, killing more than 220 uh, people, mostly Balinese, uh, along a stretch of, of street on Kuta Beach. And that is the emergence of uh, Islamist organization using violence to advocate their agenda. Last but not the least was the violence in the Moluccas Island. Uh, you might remember sectarian violence between Christian and Muslim uh, beginning January 1999 in Ambon, starting in the Ambon bus station that spread all over Ambon, Seram, Buru, Haruku Island, Saparua. In the next six years, it killed about 10,000 people. Saw the models. It only began to slow down in 2005. But by 2007, there were a group, 68 to be precise, of sort of Molucas activists dancing the so-called Chakaveri war dance, protesting against Indonesia uh, in front of then President SPY, uh, Susan Obama, visiting state uh, Ambon. And those 68 people were jailed for treason up to 20 years. Some of them are still in prison today. And then the biggest violence of them all, bigger than Aceh, bigger than East Timor, bigger than West Papua, thank you, sir, happened in the northern Molucas Island. Ternate, Tiduri, Halmahera. 15,000 people were killed. 15,000 were killed. Again, it was a mix between communal violence, Christian versus Muslim, 
but it was mostly about the so-called white forces, mostly centered around the Dori traditional Sultanate uh, power, and the Ternate group, or the yellow. They are, used, they are wearing yellow headbands. Headbands are important there. In Ambon, the headband is red and white. In the Ternate, the Dori violence, not the Moluccas, yellow and white. I will show you some, some pictures later. So after seeing all this violence, I have to note that basically no justice is being done. <coughs> uh, UN appointed a fact-finding mission called Sapir. They produced a thick document about the violence in this demo. But again, Indonesia basically ignored that report. Uh, also, oh sorry, also in Sulawesi it is smaller, about 600 per kilo, uh, Christian and, and Muslim. Uh, the Maduri's killing in Kalimantan, for instance, none. Uh, the prosecutor office in Palankaraya once tried to prosecute the president of the largest state university in central Kalimantan, for example, <coughs> and nothing happened. I have to mention professor because you cannot do all these killings up to 90,000 people without the involvement of these so-called academics. You cannot kill 90,000 people without the involvement of these so-called journalists. Journalists were involved in sowing hatred. Academics in Pontiana, in Palangkaraya, in Ambon, in Ternate, in Aceh, in Java, of course, they are involved in sowing this kind of hatred against the others. But let's take a look at what kind of identities, we are talking about identity today, that they are using to mobilize this effort to get more power, politically, socially, economically, culturally. In Aceh, they are using ethnic nationalism. Uh, Hassan de Tiro, who used to study at Columbia doing his PhD in the 1950s, uh, wrote a book and he argued that Bangsa Indonesia, the Indonesian people, the Indonesian nation, is the pseudonym of Bangsa Jawa, the Japanese people, the Japanese nation. The, the word Bangsa is, is is very nuanced. We have a translator here. Uh, Bangsa is people, is that correct? Uh, also nation. But in Indonesia, the word nationalism is translated as kebangsaan. Kebangsaan. So, Bangsa Jawa, in a bid to survive, has to colonize Sumatra Island, Kalimantan, Sulawesi, Bali, the Molokan Island, and of course Papua is the more in a bit to survive because Java is overcrowded. So thus, the Achenese use ethnic nationalism to get this new ethnic view. In Kalimantan, the Dayak people, who initially did the killing, but killed much less than the Malay, also using indigenous indigeneity, indigenous people, that the Dayak <coughs> being the indigenous people, are marginalized, which is true, under the Sumatra regime. All governors, all mayors, all regions, all, what is it, chamat, uh, district head, uh, village head, uh, deans, university president, are all either Japanese, who come from the island of Java, and of course mostly are military men, or Malay people. The bureaucracy is dominated by the Malay. This and Rudu Asli, the Indian people of Kalia, they want to gain more power. And they use violence as well. They use force. They kill the Madhuris. Why the Madhuris? According to one analysis by Jamie Davison that I used for my book, there are two main ethnic groups in Kalimantan, the Dalia and the Malay. They are more or less similar in, in terms of uh, population, about 50 people. The Dalia is a little bit uh, higher. 
And many of the Daya, when they converted to Islam, became the so-called Malay. You know? So they are relative, uh, distant relative. They don't want to kill each other. But, but in a bit to gain more power, they have to show that they have muscle. And they kill the Malays, 6,500. So one is Aceh, ethnic nationalism. The Daya is ethnicity, indigenous people rights. And then the Malay retaliated by not killing the Daya, but also killing the Maguris. And the Malay killed the Maguris more than the Daya in 1999, 3,500 in Sambas Island, uh, Sambas Agency, also beheaded. The, the method of killing is similar, hunting and killing, beheading. And of course, we have uh, independence <coughs> movement in West Papua, independence movement in Aceh. Uh, religious identity in the Moluccas island, Christian versus Muslim. But what I'm going to argue, uh, let me show you some, some picture. What I'm going to argue is, of all this, this, this mobilization, this identity, the one that the most successful, is the one that are using political Islam. This is a report that, that I have to write for Human Rights Watch. Uh, this report basically says over the last 20 years, uh, Muslim organization, Islamists, Islamist groups, political Islam group, they are combining uh, electoral democracy, uh, they are combining political parties, parliamentarian work, local parliament work, plus street vigilantes, uh, the Islamic Defenders Front, uh, pressing bars, uh, campaigning for the so-called Islamic Sharia, uh, pressing karaoke center, uh, and many other entertainment areas, restaurants, especially during the Ramadan fasting month, to, to advocate what they claim to be Islamic Sharia. And then there are two two legal, two at least two legal products that they are successful in achieving, if not three. One is the so-called religious harmony regulation, wrote written by President SDY in 2006. What is religious harmony? Religious harmony basically uh, the, the main credo basically says that the majority should protect the minorities. And the minorities should respect the majority. Majority protect, minorities respect. That is the main credo. 2006, and the government set up the so-called Religious Harmony Advisory Forum attached to all governors, regions, mayors, to advise on religious affairs including setting up new houses of worship, including renovating older houses of worship, including celebrating or not celebrating religious uh, holidays, Ashura, for instance, for the Shia, or wearing Santa hat during Christmas, Christmas sale. Uh, that, that very principle uh, is detrimental to religious freedom. Uh, guaranteed by Indonesia Constitution, 1945. Religious freedom argue that citizens are equal. Whether you are Muslim, whether you are Christian, whether you are Hindu, you have, you have equal rights. Religious harmony, no, no, no equality. The majority has veto power over the minorities. Questions, how do they do that? This religious harmony regulation says that everybody, every form, every advisory form, should be proportional with the religiousity in each area. Jakarta, 85% Muslim. Then 85% of the 21 advice, advisors on religious anyway should be Muslim. Or Bali, Hindu majority, 90% of 21 members should be Hindus. This is a dangerous regulation in a country as diverse as Indonesia. Of Indonesia, 34 provinces. Four are Christian-dominated provinces. 
remember, for Papua, West Papua, North Sulawesi, and East Nusa Tenggara, and one Hindu-dominated province. And then we have five more, where Muslim and Christian are about 50-50, mostly in Kalimantan, plus the Moluccas Island. So of these 34, we have 10 that are not Muslim dominated. It means that the religious harmony in those 10 provinces are also quite uh, negative uh, against the Sunni Muslim. This is a time bomb that was established in 2006. <coughs> the second achievement is uh, the Blasphemy Law. The Blasphemy Law was written by Sukarno in 1965 but you might see that it is being recognized, it is being used as a political tool. From 1965, when Sukarno wrote that law, until 2004, when SBY came to power, that blasphemy law was only used either eight or maximum 10 cases. Two cases did not proceed until final because of the fall of Sukarno. So, uh, in 40 years, four decades, Five president, in average, only two cases per decade. Two cases per decade, the blasphemy case. Under SBY, it was used in 89 cases, jailing 125 individuals. 125 people jailed under the blasphemy law, under SBY. Meaning that from only two individuals per decade, whoop, 125, one decade only under SBY. And now, under President Jokowi, it is going down. Five years, only 26, if not 27, fun cases, almost final now, uh, bless me. Including the case against Governor Ahok, Jakarta Governor, involving mass rally uh, in 2016. <coughs> uh, so there are two games that the Islamists have, have, have got. Uh, there's another game, which is much smaller, and people thought it is more social pressure. It is the mandatory hijab regulation. Mandatory hijab regulation. If you go back to Indonesia, let's say 20 years ago, you can see how many women wearing hijab. Now, according to a survey by a lecturer at the Muhammadiyah Islamic University in Solo, 80% of Muslim women in Java and Sumatra, the two most predominantly Muslim islands in Indonesia, 80% say that we are compelled to wear hijab. We are forced to wear hijab, either by relative parents, families, or school, or government. There are now 63 local regulations all over Indonesia where hijab is mandatory, including against non-Muslim women, Christian Muslim, Buddhist. <coughs> Aceh, West Sumatra, and South Kalimantan provinces are provinces where you have to wear hijab. The ladies should wear hijab. And the thing with hijab is it is getting, in the beginning, it is only around the neck. Small hijab, fancy, pink, orange, purple. <laughs> It is regulated later. And the age is going down. Too. The age is going down. And it is going longer covering the chest, longer covering the hip. I can show you photos after photos of this mandatory hijab. The color is becoming darker brown, dark blue, black. The Girl Scout uniform, uh, dark, dark brown, you might know. In the beginning, it was light brown. It is now becoming dark brown. Uh, the question is, is that their goal? No. Their goal is the criminal code, or we call it in Arabic, kanun jinaya. Uh, the implementation of the so-called, I keep on saying the so-called Islamic Sharia in Indonesia criminal court. They almost made it last year when the draft, uh, the criminal court was to be uh, amended, which will criminalize casual sex outside of marriage, which will criminalize 
of course, homosexuality, gay relationship, uh, and many, many other things. For no play, it was shelved because of so much pressure, including from the UN Human Rights High Commissioner, including from European embassies, <coughs> uh, US government as well. Uh, my last point is uh, the race to Istana. What will happen with this election? Uh, seeing this development over the last 20 years, uh, I would like to argue that if Prabowo is to win the election, uh, this Islamist identity will be faster implement, uh, implemented. Uh, the criminal code might be reviewed faster. <coughs> Uh, if Jokowi is to win the election, it will be slower. But it doesn't mean that Jokowi will turn back the clock. You might know that Jokowi, vice presidential candidate, Maru Amin, is the same cleric who wrote the religious harmony regulation back in 2006. And it was also Maru Amin who wrote the anti Ahmadiyya fatwa, anti Shia uh, book. Uh, for uh, FGM, female genital mutilation, for lowering marriage rates, now a quarter of Indonesia's marriages nationally involving children under 18 years old. Uh, so far, there is no sign that there are serious forces in Indonesia, serious organizations that try to undo what the negative development of the last two decades have been done. Thank you. Yes. So, um, President Jokowi chose anything but open and tolerating and uh, Muslim scholar as his running mate. Yeah. You know, we can see it as a um, sign of defeat to the Muslim power to gain Muslim vote. <coughs> but for them, it is also a sign of inclusivity because they will feel, the Islamists will feel that they are included, that they are respected, and so on. But what's, what's in it for the rest of the people? Who are the rest? The non-Muslim <coughs> people, the, the rest of the Indonesians that, um, that's against is right. Before answering that question, I need to to delve a little bit deeper into this so-called Muslim vote. Of course, we have Islamist vote. These are, you know, uh, Muslim who use Islam as a political tool. It's put that way, right? the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, of course, uh, Jama Islamia. Al Qaeda, these are Islamists. Of course, they are different. That one is using violence, the others don't. Or Islamic defenders, but these are the Islamists. Both. But we are also having a traditional Muslim, Dinatatul Ulama, the largest Muslim organization in Asia, which is split. Of course, it is split. It is big. Maro Amin is a Dinatatul Ulama cleric. In fact, he is the number one man of Dinatatul Ulama. And then we have Muhammadiyah, so-called modernist organization. This is a term, which is also complaining to uh, to correct Islam, like what had been practiced uh, mostly in Java over the last 300 years. Uh, these Muslim organizations are different. Some claim, and, and this is the claim that they like to to repeat over and over again, moderate Muslim. I would like to argue that the so-called moderate Muslims are moderate if one, they disagree with the flesh mineral. Two, they disagree with the so-called religious harmony rule. As long as you are using religious harmony, what is the difference between what you are practicing and what are being practiced in the Middle East, predominantly Muslim countries? Or, to make it non-Islam, what is the difference with Vietnam? Officially also using religious harmony. Or China, officially also using religious harmony. So these Muslim folk are 
I'm not that progressive. But I have to note that we have Abdurrahman White, the great Muslim scholar, who filed a lawsuit against the West Bank and lost in 2010. We are also having Dawa Mahajo, a Muhammadiyah scholar, who also joined the lawsuit and lost still as well. Uh, so I think we are now seeing various multiple diverse Muslim organizations debating among themselves. And we do not know what will be the end of it. But in my opinion, for, uh, at least from human rights uh, perspective, as long as you are not against the blasphemy law, you are not tolerant. Uh, you are not moderate. You are not tolerating others. As long as you are agreeing with the so-called religious harmony regulation, majority versus minority, there is no, no use of talking about moderation in Islam. <coughs> now, to Debbie's question, what will be, what will happen to the others? What will happen to the minorities? What will happen to the LGBT communities? What will happen to women? Discrimination is the least. Intimidation is medium. Violent is the most. Ahmadiyya, Muslim, religious minorities that are discriminated against in Asia are divided into three categories. One is Muslim minorities themselves. Ahmadiyya, Shia, Kafatar, Druze, Ismailia, you name them, many of them. In West Sumatra alone, there are more than 220 Islamic sects being declared as heretics, as blasphemous in West Sumatra alone. In Aceh, 15 Islamic sects are, are banned in Aceh by Governor Ivan Yusuf. So one is religious, uh, Muslim minorities. The second is non-Muslim minorities. Indonesia has six officially sanctioned religions, Islam, Sunni, of course, in this case, <coughs> Protestantism, Catholicism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism. The second minorities are these five, the non-Sunni Islam five. And the third is native religion, uh, ethnic religion, local religion, Kejawen, Parmalin, Sunda Wibitan, Kaharingan, Budiluhu. There are more than 400 uh, native religions all over Indonesia. So they are being discriminated. And the second, of course, women. Women is increasingly being discriminated, not only mandatory hijab, curfew at night. In some places, you cannot see men and women who are not married. Uh, discrimination in job, discrimination in education. Once you have mandatory hijab in school, implemented since 2014, there are human rights abuses, religious freedom, minority rights, freedom of expression, freedom of thought, access to education. Some school who refuse to to wear hijab or breach the hijab regulation, expel, of course, pressure to, to leave school. So, uh, and of course, last but not the least, the best of child uh, principle is also being breached in Indonesia. So one is religious minorities, second is women, girls especially. I have a daughter, I'm really nervous about her future. And last but not the least is LGBT communities. It is quite well known now in Indonesia. Gay men being teen, uh, lesbian girls affected from houses. Last year, more than 750 individual LGBT were arrested in Indonesia. The previous year, 2017, more than 300 in Indonesia. Next, please. Um, oh, Suzanne, Suzanne, first. Um, I'm curious, going along on that note, how much influence is there from the outside, say, from, from Saudi Arabia? Um, I, know that it, I can remember when they did went from having no head, nothing on their heads to the little head scars to it. And it seems to me that, uh, from what I've heard, that there's a lot of outside influence. With, it is not, an influence. Not, not only religion, but also money. Uh, it, is, it is complex, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, I once asked, I should not mention his name, a senior minister of the Jacobi administration, and also one American ambassador about the flow of Saudi money into Indonesia. Uh, legally, all foreign money, more than 100,000 US dollars, 
should be registered and approved by a bureau, interministerial bureau, a bureau kerjasama teknik luar negeri, uh, overseas technical cooperation bureau, 18 agencies under the state secretariat. And I asked this minister, new head, the Jokowi administration, what do you do to control the Saudi money? How much money coming from Saudi? We have the the figures from the US, USAID, Australia, DFAT, uh, World Foundation, you name them. You can list, you can check the list of all this foreign donation. The Saudi donation is insignificant. And this minister told me, we tried, but we did not succeed because it is not official via the Saudi embassy. Many are using the Margaret, what was the name? Ahara Halafa. There's so many of them, charities. Yeah. So many, so many informal financial funds, mm -hmm. including a phone base. Someone from Riyadh called someone in Jakarta. I need to transfer 30,000 cash dollars without any real transaction, just a phone call. It is done. So the influence is big. Of course, Margaret write about that. Uh, and then uh, American journalist Kritika Paragul also write about that. The influence is there, but it is not a single factor. I think it is oversimplified to say that it is a Saudi influence. Do you see any uh, conjunction between the rise of the political Islamists and radicalization of like moving towards, for example, someone from FBI and moving towards uh, group like JAD. Oh yes, uh, Sydney John write a lot about that. The Chiribon Police Mosque Bomber, for instance, uh, he initially was a member of FBI and then later joining JAT, Jamaat Ansar Tawhid, and later become a bomber. Or the so-called solo bombers, they were also involved in street vigilantes and later becoming suicide bombers. Although not all, not all suicide bombers uh, were joining state vigilantes. The Surabaya church bombing last year, uh, three families bombing three churches. One family survived, did not do the, the bombing. They did not join these state vigilantes. So there are some who joined them and some who don't. Uh, uh, the lady in the black. Um, so, on Jokowi's choice of vice presidential candidate, um, based on your observation, just your opinion, if Jokowi get elected, um, would Maruf Amin be like powerful in making the decision that would shape it towards like, a more Islamic constitution that would end up in like discriminating a lot of minority in our country, or do you think it's merely like a you know, political strategy to win the Muslim votes in the upcoming election? Because in the past, we've seen how vice presidents don't really have that much power in making regulation, but would he be an exception? Uh, based on my interviews with Natatul Ulama members, top members, and also Indonesian Ulama Council members, where I mean, still having position there, he is a, a doer. He is someone who makes phone call, reminding you Tomorrow we have a meeting, and this is the agenda. He's someone who will call you and say, tomorrow will you say this? And the other will say that. So, you know, kind of preparing meetings. Uh, when he became the Rais Am, the number one man of the Natatul Ulama, three years ago, in Surabaya, Congress Surabaya, he asked that this new, uh, this his new position, he will oversee the Sharia, uh, sorry, the Fatwa Commission of the Nadatul Ulama, unlike previous Roh Islam. So Maruf I mean, is the first Roh Islam of the Nadatul Ulama who said that I'm going to oversee this particular commission. Usually, a commission are reporting to the head of Pengurus Besar Nadatul Ulama, the, the executive branch of the Nadatul Ulama, not the legislative uh, branch of uh, the organization. Maruf Amin did it. It means that, one, he is a very practical man. Uh, he's a doer. 
and like what he did within the ulama council and the nether the ulama, he chose his own man. So if he is re-elected as, uh, elected as the vice president, I think he will pick up his own, his own man, he will pick up state-owned executive, company's executive, he will pick up some ministerial uh, position as well. So that's, that's what I think uh, Maruf Amin will do. Uh, by the way, Maruf Amin, I think, in terms of the constitution, is the most powerful politician in Indonesia nowadays, not the president. Because he almost single-handedly replaced the principle of religious freedom with religious harmony. Um, can I add a sure. question? I don't know if you've seen, but Maruf Amin actually made a video saying Merry Christmas to um, the Indonesian Christian population just like a few months ago. And a lot of people are like, oh, does this mean that he's trying to become a bit more moderate than he actually was like, ever since he's trying to like, win the election and everything? Do you think he's trying to, I don't know, be more moderate in a way? Saying Merry Christmas was never, is never banned by the Indonesian ulama council. Only fringe <coughs> ulamas, only Islamist uh, ulamas uh, say that Muslims should not say Merry Christmas. So if Mal I mean, did not do that until last year, because he did not want to confront the Islamists. Why he did it last year? I think of course for the campaign, but it was nothing. The two biggest pieces are the blessed me law and the religious harmony regulation. Yes, sir. So where where does where do the political party, the non-Islamist political parties fit into all of this? And in particular, Pei, okay, you know, and, and what does this say about, you know, Aliran? Is it is it just non-existent anymore? I mean, is there any is there any uh, support for you know, more secularist politics in Indonesia anymore? Is that just gone? Good question. For this time being, I assume that PDIP, being the largest secular political party in the nation, is very cautious. Cautious. Very cautious in addressing the blasphemy law and the religious harmony regulation. The fact that Megawati until now is still staying in power since 1996, more than 20 years, uh, one of her reasons, and one of the party's reasons, I think because of they trust her, to maintain uh, their secular position, the BDIP secular position. Why? Of course, there are Islamists infiltrating BDIP. There are BDIP regions, BDIP mayors, uh, BDIP governors <coughs> who pass uh, Sharia inspired regulation. Uh, but there is one small party, not significant maybe, which openly opposed the blasphemy law and the religious harmony regulation. It is the PSI, very interesting. New party. Young people. Young. Very young people. Yeah. Very young, Grace Natali, chairwoman. The chairwoman is a Christian, is ethnic Chinese, a woman, ethnic Chinese, opposing the blasphemy law and the religious harmony regulation. Let's see what will happen to PSI. Margaret. Um, I'd love to hear your views on what seems like a paradoxical situation, which is that most of the Islamist parties probably will not make the 4% threshold and will not be able to enter the parliament. That includes, surprisingly, Pan, Petiga, Pekas even, Bulan Bintang, definitely. So in your argument that Indonesia is heading towards a more accelerated Islamist identity, how do you explain that the Islamist parties are failing? Because Islamism is not limited within Islamist parties. Because Islamism is not limited within uh, Islamist parties. Islamism is now spreading uh, via civil society organization, NGOs. FPI is being one of the strongest of them all. FPI consistently refuse to be a political party. Uh, infiltrating the media, of course. Panta Foundation does, and with the Panta Foundation, we does a lot of research on 
journalists bias. You know, you might remember 60, 70 percent of Indonesian journalists are biased. They are for 30 uh, percent for polygamy, 90 percent against Ahmadiyya, 70 percent against Shia. Uh, the Islamists also infiltrating civil services, teachers. There are many surveys about that. Soldiers, <coughs> police, um, businesses, many many associations. So it is it is not enough just to look at that from their political parties. Next. Yes. So I think my question is kind of a two shared one. What do you think is the future of the? Wait, uh, perhaps I should uh, rephrase this. But what what do you think is like the left? Kind of like the position of the left um, in Indonesia. And what do you think of Fazi's stance on they kind of used a symbol of the labor union, which similar to, uh, I think, is like in, with the English Labor Union Party. Um, do do you think that they're actually like, they're they're portraying themselves as like some sort of like solidarity unionized kind of um, sense? I'm not sure. I don't know. What do you think? Good questions. Where is the left? The answer lies with 1965. Right? Mm -hmm. As long as we do not overcome the 1965-1966 massacres, as long as we do not find the truth, as long as we do not change our history books, as long as we do not change our museum, uh, the military bad propaganda, and of course the Islamist propaganda against the communists, uh, the left is politically very weak. So, talking about 1965, one, one huge, huge problem in Indonesia is we do not know the truth. We do not know what happened in this team. We do not know what happened in Papua. We do not know what happened in Aceh. We do not know what happened in the killing of the libraries. Uh, as long as we do not know what happened with all those mass killings, uh, post Sukarno, and also I'm afraid we are always burdened by Indonesia. It's not, not us, the intellectual the thinking elite might know it. But whether they will do something is a different matter. So PSI, my guess, I hope I'm wrong, it is going to be small uh, this year in the election. I hope I'm wrong. In the so you mentioned that 70% of journalists are biased, and how is the state of press freedom in Indonesia, and what is the role of um, the Alliance of Independent Journalists, IG, in this case? Uh, uh, by the way, INDA is a founder of the Alliance of Independent Journalists. <laughs> uh, we have set up that union 20 years ago. Press freedom is still okay. If you believe in the Press Freedom Index uh, launched by reporter Sanford yeah. Deer every year, you will see that from Adraman White era, then Megawati, and then SPY, and then Jokowi, it is always declining, continually declining. You can argue the method of reporter Sanford Deer, but the trend is I think it is correct. It is declining. A little bit going up under Jokowi, but not much. That is what the data says. What is the role of the Alliance of Independent Journalists? We did not do something back in 1994 in India. We did not ask the government to leave the restriction of foreign journalists going to Papua. Until now, foreign journalists are still restricted to go to Papua. There are many data, you can just Google Papua journalists, censor after censor, arrest after arrest, detention after detention. And also UN uh, official human rights monitor internationally, <coughs> they are still restricted to go to Papua. And by at the time, 1998, also to East Timor. Uh, 
of course, is still became independent, but Papua is still being a part of Indonesia. And I'm afraid many of the top union leaders now do not put enough attention on this. And I am getting more and more questions that Indonesian journalists do not do much in really advocating trust freedom all over Indonesia. It is still Java-oriented trust freedom. Any more questions? Yes. I wanted to ask that religious harmony is determined by province or by Kabupaten. Nationwide. But, but each province has its own majority in that province. Yes. Okay. So not some smaller unit. So uh, suppose you have a small, like a Kabupaten, which is... Oh, Kabupaten also has one. Also, also. In a Kabupaten or agency, it is 17 members. In a city or kota, 17 members. We have 514, 514 regencies and cities all over Indonesia. And we have 20, 34 provinces. And each province has 21 uh, religious harmony advisors. And this membership should be proportional with, with the religiousity of each area. You might remember two or three years ago, there is a, a ban of the Muslim in Tolikara, West Papua, of using loudspeaker during the Idul Fitri holiday. Remember that? And then that only Muslim mosque was attacked by the Papuan. It was issued by religious harmony locally. And of course, because it is 99.99% Christian, the 21 members of the religious harmony uh, council there are 100% Muslim, uh, Christian. And what was the reaction from the, from the central government? Oh, the soldiers uh, shot them. I think six were killed. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry, the lady in the purple and then... Uh, so, like, we could go, if you may know, in Instagram, there's an account named Alpa, Alpantumi. Yeah. Yeah, and then, like, he created a comic strip about yes. how being a gay in Indonesia and how being persecuted, and then suddenly the comic is being taken down by Instagram. Mm -hmm. But I just read today that it's being uh, up again in Instagram. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, what do you think about this new group? I mean, uh, would it, you think it would like amplify in the future and then increase the voice of minority and therefore like affect the government how they see this kind of issue or what do you think? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest sentiment in Indonesia now is against LGBT. It is higher than against communists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So against LGBT is 90% something. The first province that issued anti-LGBT regulations was Aceh in 2014, October. Uh, you know, if you are two men in close proximity doing so-called porn, the maximum penalty is 200 prices. Okay. I don't think LGBT issue will subside. This is this is very difficult in Indonesia. The anti-LGBT sentiment is very, very high. Being a transgender because of physical appearances, cross-dressing, is so difficult in Indonesia now. My, I have a lot of friends working with LGBT groups, and they bread and butter every day is transgender being arrested, being beaten. So it's difficult. This is. This is even worse than the communists. This is even worse than the Ahmadiyya. Of all these religious minorities, in terms of the level of violence, the worst is the Ahmadiyya. Of course, quantitatively, the biggest victim is Christian. According to Human Rights Watch database, as of 2012, there are 1,056 churches being closed down. But Tempo later updated, uh, late last year, 2,200 for since the religious harmony rule established in 2006. Among the Islamists, the, the math is simple. You know? Christian is about 10% in Indonesia. Meanwhile, churches is about 17% of all houses of worship in Indonesia. So they want to reduce the number of churches, 
down to at least closer to 10%, rather than 70. And the difference is 5,000. Mm -hmm. So now if they have closed down 2,000, it is about 40% uh, already down. So LGBT is difficult. <coughs> but I do not know whether it was Instagram who did that or the person uh, uh, himself who did that. Yes, sir, uh, on the back. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I, uh, th that was really interesting. I come at this uh, working mostly on, on Burma, Myanmar, so I'm not an Indonesian expert. Um, but um, it strikes me that within ASEAN, within the region, you have potentially similar trends. Um, certainly up in, in, in Myanmar, going the other way, the Buddhist um, majority uh, discriminating against a Muslim minority. Um, and with ASEAN perhaps ambitious about further integration, I wonder if there are any conversations happening, either between governments or civil society, amongst ASEAN countries about the kind of trends that you've been describing. They are working now. In fact, Indonesia is the only country that has access to a kind state. Mm. The Indonesian military, armed forces, army mostly, is doing what they call inter-religious dialogue programs inside Rakhine State. Basically, the TNI, Indonesian Armed Forces, is playing like a big brother role inside Myanmar. Tatmadaw and TNI <coughs> had decades of relationship between the two. I talked to some uh, high-ranking officers involved in this program. Basically, they are introducing religious harmony into Myanmar. Of course, they will acknowledge that the majority there is Buddhist. Thus, the Buddhists will have the veto power over the Muslim in Myanmar. But what they are trying to do, they are setting up uh, one hospital in Rakhine State, I think in Sikwe, or I can check, maybe I'm wrong, and then doing the inter-religious dialogue. They are introducing similar concepts. They believe in this concept, majority, minority, religious harmony. Uh, yes, Michelle. Um, so I think it is <coughs> known that the decision to pick Maruf Amin as the running mate of Jokowi is to secure the voters of conservative Muslims, in particular those who are part of the 212 movement who opposed uh, governor, uh, former governor Ahok. But I think in reality, those who claim to be part of the, the alumni, the 212 movement, still does not give their support for Jokowi. Any thoughts? It is true. The question is, will Jokowi win or not? I don't know. Because the, the trend, the Pulling the, the, the trend of the electability, uh, Jokowi is not going higher, is not increasing. Meanwhile, Prabowo is still in his 30%, but the trend is increasing. So I don't know what will happen. Uh, April is still very long to predict now <laughs> in February. Anything can happen. Who knows? Someone within the Jokowi team, uh, you know, slip of the tongue, saying something uh, not, not incorrect, but something bizarre that can be used, like what Aho did uh, uh, in 2016. What Aho said was just about Almeida first, uh, uh, 52, in which he said that first had been used by politicians not to elect non-Muslim leaders among the Muslims. Uh, video edited, uh, boosted by Facebook, and Facebook and Google and Twitter are a problem here, like in the US, uh, then something can still happen. We don't know. It is volatile. But what I'm trying to do with, with this book is I'm trying to take a look this trend over the last 20 years, how people using ethnicity, using nationalism, using religion, of course, and indigenous people rights, to gain more political, social, economic power. And those that are succeeded the most is those that, that uh, are those that use 
Islam has the portal to. And that is the trend. Maybe we can collect just if there's last questions, and then because we're going to have to get out of the room pretty soon. Do I see one, two, three folks? Yes, please. Um, all right. Uh, just returning to sort of the broader question, and I'm wondering if I can ask you to speculate to what extent the trends that you're describing um, were, to some sense, inevitable as a result of the dismantling of oppressive structures and global trends and so on, to what extent they may have emerged because of the failure of democratic structures to be put in place. If you can kind of parse out based on your research, um, what, some of the, what the sources of, of the trends that you're describing are. So let's say again. So the question is, try to simplify the, simplify it, but if it's possible based on your research to, um, to uh, distinguish between to what extent the trends you're describing were inevitable um, based on demography and global trends and the end of uh, many years of oppression, <coughs> and to what extent they emerged from the failures of democratization and the rough possible failures. Very difficult. <laughs> I I don't think this trend will change politically if there is no economic crisis. Uh, Indonesia changed in 1998, Suharto, because of the Asian crisis. In 1965, also a crisis, inflation was under Sukarno than 700%. And of course, the Cold War, the Vietnam, uh, later the Vietnam War. So this trend is going to happen. This Islamization of Indonesia, the campaign of the Islamic Sharia, discriminating women, LGBT, religious minorities, will keep on going uh, unless there is a crisis, economic crisis. Economic crisis will open uh, to a social crisis, and then social crisis will trigger a political change. My, my take on all this analysis is let's prepare uh, when the crisis happens. So let's prepare the groundwork. Let's strengthen uh, organization, civil society organization that can work for the post-crisis era. So for the time being, the only option is the economic crisis. Yes, yes. We have said before that Islamism is more than political parties in the media. And you know, I'm curious about more on the seemingly rising exclusivity among modern Muslims in Indonesia and the role of social media and online media. Now that the social media and online media are rampant, like even a person with master degree or PhD, they believe more on the story shared by their friend on a group chat like WhatsApp and Facebook more than the formal media itself like Comas or even Metro TV. And I, I, I would like to believe in the freedom of speech, but somehow it goes hand in hand with the rising hate speech within the social media and the online media. And we have learned as well from the past that dealing with intolerance with automatic measures will always lead to backlash. But somehow, as an Indonesian myself, I, I kind of like want to have this censorship, but at the same time, I still want to maintain freedom of speech. Like, um, what's your like? What's your opinion on this like media or information ecosystem in Indonesia and like going forward? What I'm not sure like what should be our course of action to maintain freedom of speech, but as to also maintain the tolerance. Our, our, our position is always, as long as it does not incite violence, it is OK. Even inciting hate speech is still problematic, but I tend to say I will accept. I will take a look at case by case. So you can, you can be ignorant, you can be stupid, <laughs> despite having a master degree or PhD degree. <laughs> uh, my, there are many papers written about this. It is the quality of education in Indonesia. Uh, there are so much propaganda, so much, what is it, comments in Indonesian school, from primary to high school to universities, to the extent that students are not critical, despite having PhD degree in Indonesia. 
Yeah, that, that is, and of course, with the social media, the role of gatekeepers among media companies are not significant at all now. Uh, it is unfortunate, but it is a fact of life. That they are doing. I think there's one more. Yeah, if there's time. Yep, I think. So, uh, you framed your talk in terms largely of religious uh, identities, with also with some ethnicity. I'm just curious, it's fascinating to me. You, I don't think, you may not have mentioned the word Chinese Indonesians during this. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, but also, you know, 20, 25 years ago, that would have been, of course, a big issue. So, I'm just curious, given the, what this trend you're projected, well, not just trend you're projecting, but this reality of growing, you know, whether it's Islamist nationalism or populism, you know, where does that leave the Chinese, the Indonesian Chinese middle class and, you know, and, and business interests? What's happening? What are they thinking? What are they doing? Uh, Anti-Chinese sentiment is still widespread in Indonesia. I actually prepared this picture, but I was busy talking. <laughs> that's why, that's why, uh, Remember the debate two days ago when Rago was asked by Jokowi, you have so many lands in East Kalimantan and Aceh. Uh, Rago responded immediately, I am a patriot. It is better for me to control those <laughs> hundreds of thousands of hectares of land rather than being controlled by a single foreigner, meaning Chinese. Uh, so the, the sentiment is still there. Again, as long as we do not know the truth of what happened in 1965, in 1948, in 1967, the killing of, of many, many Chinese, thousands of Chinese along the border of Kalimantan, uh, we are always going to be burdened by this kind of thing, and so much burdened by this. But just to I know you, but to follow up, I mean, the Chinese have mobility. Yeah, I mean, at least yes. the, more, the more affluent Chinese. So is there any evidence that you know you're, you're starting to see the the affluent Chinese oh, know, yes. socioeconomic class yes. you know leaving, sending their families abroad, any this sort of stuff? I happen to have the inside database of the Panama Papers. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a founding member of uh, the organization that that, that that keep that that data. I see, I see, International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. I haven't done ethnic analysis of the data of the thousands of names of Indonesian citizens. But my guess, reading uh, from the name Vijaya or whatever, <laughs> these are all Chinese Indonesian names. Harsono is not. <laughs> I don't like ethnic Chinese, but it is not a typical uh, Chinese name. And interestingly, this is my guess. There are more and more ethnic Chinese from Java, from the affluent cities of Jakarta, Surabaya, are buying lands in Papua, in Sumba, in Christian-dominated Indonesia, in Manado. I got many phone calls, personal friend of mine, family, friends. You know, you have all these OPM people around you. <laughs> the, the, free, uh, the free Papua movement people. Is it safe if we buy land here, or there, in Kalahari, or Jaipura, or Manapari? So and that all every Chinese. This is the thing that I did not see uh, 20 years ago, when they are starting to buy lands in Christian dominated Indonesia. 